Miss Taylor and Nikki, you want to come on up, and they're going to sing a special for us, and then after they sing, Brother Booth will preach for us this evening. All right. Thank you, ladies. That's a wonderful song. Sound like we could pull an invitation right now. Amen. If you listen to the words of that song, and uh, boy, it's that's powerful. If we could just live our lives with nothing between our soul and the Savior, it'd be amazing what God might do through us. Well, I appreciate you being here tonight, and many of you have been faithful each night of the the week so far, and I appreciate that. I don't mind if you miss tomorrow night. It'll, it'll be all right, and uh, but I, I appreciate you being out tonight, good good Wednesday night crowd tonight, and uh, praise the Lord for that. I um, have enjoyed the day today. I, I uh, had the joy to go out tonight uh, to dinner with uh, the Wallaces, and, and uh, Brother Wallace forced me to eat too much, and uh, but uh, we, we had a good fellowship, enjoyed it, and appreciate that, and uh, I just have enjoyed my week here. I always do. I, your pastor and I, um, uh, I just uh, there's some guys you just bond with immediately, and and uh, we think a lot alike, and that's scary. And uh, and the, I really enjoy the fellowship, and uh, it's an encouragement to me to be here. And uh, I trust that the Lord has done some good things in your heart, and that He will tonight. And I do appreciate you pray tomorrow night, uh, preaching to the. Uh, fellows in prison and and uh, be delight to see some folks saved and uh, you know what's the the value of just one soul is tremendous and uh, so like to see some folks saved and then 
Friday night at the Art Youth. Sure like to be a help there. And uh, then I'll be heading home Saturday. And uh, I was just thinking about it. I guess this month, uh, the, in the, this past month, I've been home two days. And uh, my wife got to go with me for two weeks of that. Uh, uh, one of the trips we were out in New Mexico for two, wait, two weeks. I got home for two days and then, then uh, came this way. And, and uh, so uh, it would be good to get home. Uh, for a few days, and, and uh, but God has been so faithful, and I'm so grateful that uh, he's allowed me to stay busy, and um, I'm grateful for that, and uh, so thank the Lord, he's been mighty good to me. I want you to open your Bibles tonight to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 4. I was sharing with a preacher the other day, uh, I believe I was at his house, and I was sharing with him that my, um, my granddaughter that lives close to us, that's six, Kylie, she, I came home a couple months ago, I had driven uh, quite some distance uh, from where I was preaching to get home on, on a Thursday, and I got home Thursday evening, was going to leave out Saturday for a meeting, and uh, so I got home, and I was tired, and, and uh, I got home, she says, she said, Papa, let's go out and run. I said, Honey, Papa is tired. And I said, I've been driving all day. And I said, Besides that, honey, Papa's got to leave again Saturday morning because Nana won't let me stay here very long. <laughs> and she grabbed my face with both of her hands and she looked at me and she says, Now, Papa, you know that's not true. <laughs> she said, You've got to go preach. I said, Yes, ma'am. All right. <laughs> They're fun, aren't they? How many of you have grandchildren? Amen. Isn't that a blessing? My doctor said, uh, can you name all, all 18 of your grandchildren? I said, I sure can. I named them. She said, well, how in the world do you remember that? And I said, when you pray for them every single morning, you remember their names. Amen. And uh, great responsibility we have as grandparents. Uh, pray for our grandkids. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It's interesting if you'll remember a little bit about the Corinthian church that Paul rebuked them, especially in this first uh, epistle of the Corinthian church, and, and, uh, and had to scold them about many things. They were very carnal, uh, fleshly. Uh, um, they were very uh, childlike in, in their Christian life. They, they had a fussing between each other, and they argued about, you know, well, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Jesus, and... And, you know, that was in chapter 3, and uh, Paul rebukes them about that. And then he goes to chapter 4, and look what he says at verse 1. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Paul said, you know, there's not a one of us that's anything more than just a servant, a minister. That's what the word minister means, just a servant. He said, there's no big shots here. I'm just a servant, and I have a responsibility as a steward. And you know, that's true about every one of us, isn't it? It doesn't matter what title we have. As a Christian, we're just servants. Every one of us. You say, well, I'm just a, I'm just a new Christian. I'm just learning. Well, understand, it doesn't matter if you're new Christian or old Christian. We're all just servants. We get to serve the Lord. And it's a great privilege. And he says, and stewards. Now, a steward is, is, is uh, somebody that's not an owner. And that's one of the great lessons to learn in the Christian life. We're not owners. We're just stewards. A steward is, is one who works for the owner and uh, has been given and delegated certain responsibilities that you manage under the guidance of the owner. Our Heavenly Father is the owner of all of it. We're just stewards. We just get to participate. We get to, to manage the responsibilities in our, in our serving that God gives to us. And then he goes on to say in verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. My son, my oldest son, has, uh, has owned several businesses at, at times and, and uh and he said, you know, Dad, one of the most difficult things in running a business 
is to find people that you can hire that are trustworthy. He says it's just a battle. And you know, you'd think as many people are crying, well, we need more jobs. The people that had jobs would be faithful, in, but it's hard to find them. And the Lord said, you know, if you're looking to have somebody that you're going to give some responsibility to as an owner, the, pri uh, the priority is to find somebody that's faithful, dependable, trustworthy. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The longer I serve the Lord, the more I am grateful for people that are just faithful. Just faithful. Being where God wants them to be, doing what God wants them to do, when God wants them to be there, and when God wants them to do what they're doing. Just faithful. You know, sometimes we get confused about, well, you know, I go to church every, every week. Well, that's not all there is to being faithful. We're to be faithful 24-7. We're to serve the Lord all the time. We're to always have our heart in tune with the Lord, doing the will of God. Every one of us is Christians. Christianity isn't a Sunday, Wednesday thing. It's a, it's a seven-day-a-week thing. To be faithful. You know, you wouldn't say to a, a, a husband, he's a good husband if he's faithful six days out of the week. <laughs> Amen. You'd prefer he'd be faithful seven days out of the week. And that's what the Lord wants from us. He wants us to be faithful in our Bible reading, faithful in our prayer life. Faithful in the opportunities he brings our way to, to win souls and witness to people. Faithful in serving. If we have a responsibility, being faithful. And that's what he says. It's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. Look over at Proverbs chapter 20. And look at verse 6. It says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Well, we fundamentalists know that, don't we? But a faithful man, who can find? They're hard to find. Faithful. When I was pastoring, man, I just so appreciated folks that were faithful. I appreciated folks that if I gave them a responsibility to do in the church, I didn't have to babysit them. They're just faithful. They're going to serve as unto the Lord. Whether they get a pat on their back or whether they don't get a pat on the back. Unto the Lord. Just serve. And that's what the Lord said. It's required of a man, of a steward, that a man be found faithful. Now, what does that word faithful mean? Well, Webster defines it in that 1828 Webster Dictionary as firm adherence to the truth or firm adherence to duty or conformable to truth, or constant. It really means full of faith, just always full of faith. When I was, I was given the opportunity, I think three years ago or so, um, that I, I was asked to preach an a early morning session at Revival Fires National Conference that Brother Coral puts on in, in, uh, in Illinois. And, and, uh, th but I got there for the whole week, and I was speaking on a Thursday morning early, but but I got there for Monday night to start off the, the, the conference, and I'll never forget, there was an older gentleman got up to preach. He was 90 years old. 90 years old, he got up to preach. I'd never heard of him before in my life. The man, he got up and preached with fervor and power, and you know what the title of his message was? It's worth it. Thrilled my soul. And you know, Sometimes the old devil comes along during the journey of the Christian life and loves to poke us and say, really, is it worth it? Is it worth it to be faithful? You know, you're not going to grow in your Christian life without trials. It's not going to happen. God, God promises. That's one of the ways he grows us is through the difficulties, through the trials of life. And everybody's going to face them. But it's during those times that the old devil loves to come, come along and say, really? I mean, is it worth it? Is it really worth it to be faithful? You know, we hunger, those of us who love the Lord, hunger for that day when we stand before him and we hear him say, well done, thou good and 
faithful servant. But I have found in my own Christian experience that it's during the times of heartache that that wicked old devil comes along and pokes me and really, why is God letting this happen to you? Is it really worth it? Is it worth it to be faithful? You know, you bring your kids home when they're born. You lay them in that bassinet. You kneel by their bassinet. You cry. You say, dear God, protect them. Lord, help them as soon as they're old enough to understand that they'll trust Jesus. And God, please work in their hearts that they won't have to experience the bitter taste of sin and wickedness of this old world and the empty life of following this world. God, protect them. You, you raise them and you put them in, in Christian education and you try to, to protect them as much as you can and help them to grow in the Lord and you make sure that they're in church and you try to set a, a good example and all, all of that and then they could be 18, 19 years of, of age and they get out on their own and they make choices that literally rip your heart out and the old devil comes along and said, really? Was it worth it? You sacrificed, you gave yourself, you prayed and prayed and prayed, and now look, really, was it worth it? He loves to do that. My dad was out of the ministry for seven years when I was growing up. When I was in Bible college, he went back in the ministry and pastored again. But during my teenage years, my dad was out of the ministry, but we went to church faithfully. Dad taught an adult Sunday school class. I remember it was the end of my freshman year of high school and we'd been going to a really dead Baptist church and there's a bunch of those out there. Nobody ever said a holy grunt. There was never an amen in the service. Uh, thank you. I just, I just check it on you a little bit there, you know. A little quiet there for a while. Nobody ever came to the altar, you know. Nobody got saved and and, and then my brother began to go to another independent Baptist church, kind of the opposite direction of where we lived. And it was about 20, uh, 20 minutes away from where we lived, up where I went to high school. And my brother was three years older than me, and he started going there for real spiritual reasons. There was a good-looking blonde there. She said she wouldn't date him unless he went to her church, and so he felt led to go there. They've been married now 42, 43 years, something like that. But she had a wonderful testimony at our, our public high school and, and thank God for her. So I started going to church there too because my brother was going there. It wasn't long until my parents also decided to come to church there and thank God for that church. So an old-fashioned preacher wasn't afraid to look at us teenagers and stick his bony finger in our face and say, you know, you, 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 got, you got some things you got to work on, don't you? I mean, he'd tell it like it was. And thank God for him. He loved us and told me the truth and and I remember God broke my heart about the second service I was there. And I said, man, here I, I haven't been much of a testimony to my friends at the school. They're going to hell. And, man, I, I just need things to change. And I decided to just give the Lord my heart and life. And I went to a, a camp, teen camp that summer. And at that teen camp, I heard an old man get up and preach. And he preached on being a soldier of the army of Christ. And God broke my heart. He said, we need some frontline soldiers. And I went forward and I told my pastor, Pastor, God's calling me to preach. And I surrendered to preach. I couldn't wait to get home. I wanted to get home and tell my dad. And when I got home, I said, Dad, I made a life-changing decision this week at camp. He said, tell me about it. I said, God called me to preach, Dad. I surrendered to preach. I so much wanted him to be excited about it. I so much wanted him to say, man, I'm so thrilled. But that's not what he did. He did his absolute best to talk me out of it. And I didn't understand initially. Later on, I understood. He said, son, I never wanted anything in your whole life for you except you to do the will of God. But I knew that if I could talk you out of it now, the old devil would for sure talk you out of it down the road. And now, preacher, I understand. After 39 years and fighting the devil and 
his attacks and disappointments in life and all of those kind of things that the old devil will constantly come along to you and say, really, is it worth it? It, it saddens my heart tonight. How many stories I know of folks that were in church for 20 years faithful and ended up today they wouldn't darken the door of a church. It's his trick. He always loves to challenge that. Is it worth it to be faithful? Demas didn't think so, did he? The Bible says that in Paul's most crucial time of need, that De he said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. At one time, Demas was faithful servant. Was it worth it in the, the New Testament for those who followed the Lord Jesus Christ? I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter 11 with me. You know, in Hebrews 11, it begins to list all of those amazing faithful servants that were such an example. And, and, and I mean, he talks about, uh, you know, Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and on and on he goes. But then he gets down here to verse 36 of Hebrews 11. And it says, and others. Doesn't mention their name. They never had a sermon in revival fires. They were never asked to preach in a conference. They never was able to report that they had thousands in Sunday school. It just says others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Boy, that bothered me. I mean, these people that stayed so true to the Lord, that went through such awful persecution and torture, it says, receive not the promise. What's that mean? It means God didn't deliver them from their sufferings until they got to heaven. But on this earth, He didn't deliver them from their sufferings. But I want to tell you something, folks. For some reason, they still believed it was worth it to be faithful. Look at the... The apostles, every single one of them. Matthew, he was slain with the sword. Mark was dragged to death in Alexandria. Luke was hung from an olive tree in Greece. And they say he continued to preach until he couldn't take another breath. John was boiled and then banished. And Peter was crucified upside down out of Rome. And James the greater but was beheaded in Jerusalem. And James the less was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. And while he was laying in the street dying, he kept on preaching. And Bartholomew was flayed alive and preached till he died. And Andrew was crucified and kept pulling up to try to preach another sentence. And Jude was shot through with arrows. And Barnabas stood at Thessal was stoned at Thessalonica. And Thomas was run through with a lance in the East Indies. And Matthias was stoned, to, uh, uh, then beheaded. And Paul was beheaded by a Nero, but dear friend, for some reason they just believed. It was worth it to be faithful. Is it worth it to be faithful? You see, being faithful is just a choice. Anybody here tonight that is saved can be faithful if you choose to be faithful. It takes no special talent. It takes no special intellect. It just takes a heart that chooses to be faithful. Is it worth it to be faithful? Let me answer why it's worth it to be faithful tonight. It's worth it to be faithful, number one, because there's always sufficient grace available. There's always sufficient grace available. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 with me. I love this definition that Webster gave of the, the, the word grace says a divine influence in renewing the heart and restraining from sin. Isn't that a good thought? 
divine in influence in renewing the heart and restraining from sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, here's the, the passage where, where Paul was reminding the Corinthian church that they had promised to, to, to give a, an offering for the poor in Jerusalem. And he's reminding them that they need to, to keep their, their vow to God about that. And they were kind of dragging their feet on the matter. And, and he says to them in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye have always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. He's saying, listen, God's grace is, is sufficient to help you to do what you said you were going to do. It's that divine influence. It's that in your heart as a Christian that in any given situation, God will give you the desire to do the right thing. Doesn't mean you'll always do the right thing. But it's available. Look at uh, chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. And here's where Paul, after he enumerates all the perils and trials he went through in chapter 11, he goes into chapter 12 and he says um, that he, he three times asked the Lord to remove this thorn in the flesh that was such a difficulty for him. And in verse 9 it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul's response was, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It is that divine influence. And God said he'll always provide sufficient grace in every situation. Is it worth it to be faithful? Yes, because there's always sufficient grace available. But hear me, please hear me tonight. It doesn't mean that you'll always receive sufficient grace. All of us that have been saved very long know people that have gone through the trials and they didn't evidence much grace. Why? If God promises grace will always be sufficient, it doesn't mean that you'll always receive that sufficient grace. It's always available. But you see, you've got to understand, you can't receive grace from a posture of pride. Because the scripture says that God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the... He only gives grace to the humble. See, you can't get bitter at God in the trials and expect to receive the grace. You can't shake your fist at God and say, I don't deserve this. Let me remind you, dear child of God, if you and I got what we deserved, we'd be stuffed into hell tonight. But we get proud. We want it our way and we get frustrated. And, and you can't receive that sufficient grace. Some of the most precious Christians I've known that have been some of the most gracious people I've ever met went through the most horrendous trials. But they were just humble enough to say, okay, God, I don't understand it. I trust you. I need that sufficient grace. There's always sufficient grace available. It just doesn't mean you'll always receive that grace. At the loss of a loved one, that's not the time to get mad and bitter and throw in the towel. That's the time to get your grace bucket filled up. The attack of critics, that's not the time to sit on the sidelines and pout and be a, act like you're some kind of victim. And I remind you tonight, as a child of God, I'm never a victim. As a child of God, there's nothing can happen to me outside of his permission, so I'm never a victim because he always wants what's best for me. We've got to get rid of this stinking victim mentality. When, when the disappointments of life come along and the old devil pokes you in the side and says, is it really worth it? Yeah, it's worth it because there's sufficient grace available. There's sufficient grace available for Paul while he was in jail right into the Philippian church. There was sufficient grace for, for uh, uh, John the Baptist when he had his head cut off, but he kept preaching the truth. There was sufficient grace for Stephen when he was stoned to death. And he said, don't lay it to their charge, Lord. There's sufficient grace for every one of those martyrs. And I'm telling you, there will always be sufficient grace there for you if you're humble enough to receive it. 
Is it worth it to be faithful? Yes, because there's sufficient grace, number two. It's worth it to be faithful because we have a sovereign God. We have a sovereign God. He makes no mistakes. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. I'll give you some wonderful verses tonight. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 it says, There hath no, tempt taken, uh, no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. God's always faithful. He's sovereign. He's always faithful. He never makes a mistake. Look over at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. I love this one. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. He said, no matter whether you believe it or not, he's still going to be faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't made a mistake in the past. He's not going to make one in the present. He won't make one in the future. He's sovereign. He always is able to fulfill every promise he's ever made to us. And he will guarantee that we can finish our course with his power and, and ability. My dear friend, he's faithful. You, you remember the story of Joseph? I love the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember, his brothers sold him out. They were jealous of him. But Joseph was a faithful man, a faithful young man. Listen to me, young people. Joseph was faithful to obey his mom and dad. Joseph was faithful to, to, to follow after the God of his mom and daddy. His brothers got jealous, and so they, they, they were going to kill him and then decided better not kill him, so they sold him to... Potiphar traveling through there and that Potiphar bought him as a slave and he becomes a slave and, and here he is on his way hundreds of miles away from mom and daddy from the parents that loved him so much and he loved and, and his brothers had sold him out. Can you imagine the old devil coming along to Joseph and say, really? You were faithful to your, your mom and daddy? You were faithful to trust the God that they taught you about? How's that worked out for you? Look where you're at now. All this way, of, you don't know if you'll ever see your family again. And then we know how that Joseph, God just kept blessing him, and Joseph rose to the top with Potiphar, and Potiphar said, hey, i got to go on a business trip. I'll leave you in charge of the ranch. And he took off on a business trip, and Potiphar's wicked wife come by and tried to seduce Joseph, but he was too faithful. He said, how could I sin against my master or sin against my God? And he ran out of his coat. He was faithful. Well, how'd that work out for you, Joseph? Well, she lied about me when he got back in town. They threw me in prison. Imagine the old devil coming to Joseph. Really? Really, Joseph? When are you going to learn? That God you talk about that's such a good God? Man, look where you're at now. You're in prison. Your brother sold you out. Now you've been lied about. You're stuck in prison. And then you remember he interpreted that dream. And that sorry guy got out of, the, out of prison and forgot to tell the Pharaoh who told him the dream. And he stuck in there several more years. And then finally, he's delivered from that prison. He's put in that place as governor over the land. And his brothers come and they're in need of, of grain. And Joseph is in charge of all of that. They didn't even recognize who Joseph was, but he knew who they were. But Joseph wasn't bitter. And Joseph didn't retaliate. When they realized it was Joseph, they wept and cried. They thought they were going to be dead for sure. Had I been Joseph, they'd have been dead for sure. <laughs> but Joseph was a much better Christian. And you know what Joseph's response was? You meant it for evil. 
But God, a sovereign God that had a purpose and plan in every step of it, He meant it for good because there's much people needed saved alive. Is it worth it to be faithful? It's worth it because there's always sufficient grace. It's worth it because there's a sovereign God that can be trusted. I want you to understand Romans 8, 28 and 29 is still in the book. But we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, those that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his Son. And all these things and all the difficulties and all the heartaches and all of the struggles and all the trials, God is using those things to make me more and more like Christ. There's always sufficient grace. We have a sovereign God that can be trusted then let me tell you a third. There's always a sure gain ahead. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man shall, God's promise, shall abound with blessing. A faithful man shall abound with blessing. I don't know how God will bless you for being faithful. He may bless you with, with, with material things. He may bless you uh, once you get to heaven like he did with those that we read about in Hebrews 11, those others that didn't get the blessing until they got to heaven. I don't know how he's going to bless you. He doesn't promise that he's going to give you a raise and pay and all that kind of junk you hear on television. That's not what God promises you. In fact, well, some, of the, some of the greatest Christian God refers to were the Macedonian churches who gave out of their great poverty, he said. So all that junk you hear on TV, just ignore that. That's not Bible. But he does say that he'll bless you if you're faithful. There are blessings ahead. And only God knows how those blessings will come. Look over at Revelation chapter 2. Verse 10. In addressing the church at Smyrna that was a suffering church. It says in verse 10, 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Remember the apostle Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I kept the faith, finished my course. Henceforth is laid up for me. A crown of righteousness, not for me only, but for all those that love his appearing. There's a sure gain ahead if we stay faithful. You imagine Timothy's mother. I don't know if you've ever thought about Timothy's mother. As Paul said about Timothy, there was no man as like-minded with him as Timothy. And he said, Timothy had an unfeigned faith, a pure, no malice, pure faith. And he said he learned the scriptures from his grandmother and his mother. Now, some of this is a little bit speculation, but it never says anything about his father except that his father was a Greek. But it never mentions his dad having any spirituality. I'm just saying my speculation, I would think that if his father would have had some spiritual influence, it would have mentioned it, since it mentioned his mother and his grandmother. So here's his mother. I'm just asking you to picture this. She's a Jew. I'm telling you, for a Jew to follow Jesus Christ in that day was not a popular thing. The other Jewish leaders, the Jewish neighbors, they, they looked down on them, they persecuted them, they mocked them. But here was a Jewish lady whose husband wasn't following, but she followed. And she wanted her son to follow Jesus. She taught him. Can you imagine how many times the devil must have come? He poked her in the side and said, Really? You got the neighbors laughing at you. Your husband doesn't want you going to church. I mean, you got, you got the, the elders of, of, that you've known for years. They, they despise you. I mean, you got all these people telling you it's, you're, you're being a fool. Is it worth it? 
and see her at the end of her life saying, hey, old devil, have you seen who's pastor in that church in Ephesus? That's my boy. It's my boy, Timothy. Oh, there's a sure gain ahead. You just stay faithful. See, faithful is a 24-7 responsibility. And you see, I don't know if you're faithful 24-7 or not. Only God knows that. Only God knows what you look on on the internet. Only God knows what kind of stuff you watch on television. Only God knows what you pull up on your phone. Only God knows those things. I don't know that thing. But we got a whole lot of folks sitting in independent Baptist churches that are, are experiencing very little blessing. And my God says, if you're faithful, you shall be blessed. God knows what your priorities are. He knows what little thing will keep you out of church. I'm amazed. We, we miss church for birthdays. We miss church for vacation. And, and I'm wondering, I wonder how God feels about that when he gave his son's blood shed a Calvary for me. That I'm on vacation, I don't have time for him. <laughs> I got time for him every single day. And you do too if you take it. See, it's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. And if we're faithful, there is a sure gain. There's going to be rough roads. There's going to be heartaches. There's going to be trials. There's going to be disappointments. We're going to see people, well, man, I thought he was a so-and-so. Hey, I want to tell you, every person you see is just flesh. All of us capable of the same old failures if we walk in this flesh. Don't matter who if they're doctor so and so or what they are. All of us have this same old flesh. You walk in the flesh, there's not one person in here that has a better sin nature than somebody else. We all just got a wicked old sin nature. And so we have to walk in the spirit. I was preaching in Frederick, Maryland a number of years ago. First time I went there, Frederick is about uh, about 40 miles, I think, from uh, Washington, D.C. And um, I remember the pastor when I got there, and it's the first time I met him except over the phone, and, and, uh, and he took me and showed me the church, nice, beautiful little building. They'd started a church in downtown Frederick. And um, I remember during the revival meeting, you know, we're 40 minutes from Washington, D.C. I was really hoping the Obamas were going to come. I had some things I wanted to share with them. They didn't make it. But the pastor, he showed me the building, a nice little building. He said, now, Brother Booth, on Sunday morning, we'll probably have about 35 people here. I said, well, praise the Lord. doesn't matter to me. I'll preach to whoever shows up. He said, but during that time, he said, we also have a Spanish church of about 40 people meeting. And I said, praise the Lord, brother. That's great. He said, but we need to stop right on time Sunday morning because as soon as we're done, we walk out, we have a Burmese church walk in. And he said, there's about a hundred of them. And I said, a what? He said, a Burmese church. I said, where did they come from? He said, Burma. <laughs> Don't have to be smart to be an evangelist, you know, just willing <laughs> I said, no, preacher, I understand they probably, that they came from Burma, but what are they doing in Frederick, Maryland? He said, well, let me tell you a story, Brother Booth. He said, I was in my office one day working, and, and a guy knocked on the door. I, I told him to open the door, and he came in, nice, sharp-looking, young Burmese man. He said, Pastor, I, he introduced himself. He said, he said we recently lo relocated here to Burma, uh, or to uh, Frederick. He said, we're from Burma. And he said, in, in Burma, we're from a state that is about 98% born-again believers. He said, but the central government has become so oppressive that the American government has offered us political asylum and told us certain places that we could come and settle in, and Frederick was the place we settled in. He said, but we're Baptist. And he said, we, we need a church. But he said, uh, preacher, he said, um, he said, I, I just wondered if, because of a lot of our older people, especially don't, don't speak English, and would you allow me to pastor them under your leadership? 
if we could come and join your church, but I'll, I'll pastor them under your leadership. But he said, I promise you, I'll never undermine you. You have the authority, and, and, and we're Baptists. We're Bible believers. The pastor said, man, I, I just started questioning him on doctrine. I went one doctrine after another doctrine after. Man, he said, I went down. They, he had everything right. He said, Brother Booth, I looked at him and said, how in the world did you learn your doctrine so well? I mean, you're right on target about everything. He said, Pastor, you might have heard about an American missionary years ago named Adam Hiram Judson who came to our country. He said, we are descendants of his converts. Whew, I want to tell you what, I just about turned Baptocostal. <laughs> I wanted to run them out and start shouting. If you ever read the story about Adoniram Judson, you would know that Adoniram Judson did not intend to go to Burma. That was not where he was headed. But because of, of, of a, a difficulty, I think there was a shipwreck or something. I can't remember exactly what the, the, the detail was. But he ended up having to go to Burma. And while he was in Burma, he couldn't speak their language. And he couldn't communicate. And here he's trying to win them to Christ, but he couldn't communicate with them. And he went almost seven years, during which time he ended up being thrown in prison. They thought he was part of a, 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 a civil war that started up, and they thought he was a spy, and he spent two years in prison. His wife would have to come and try to send him notes under a cell to a door to try to encourage him. I mean, went through all of this. Can you imagine how the devil must have come to him and said, what a fool you are. You're over here, your wife and your kids, and you've been thrown in prison, and you don't even have a convert to show for it. It was almost seven years before he had his first convert. He buried his wife and his children under Burmese sod that died over there with illness. Didn't look so good, but now all these years later, 98% of a state that's born again believers because a faithful man shall abound with blessing. I was preaching about this in Mesquite, Texas, a church that went through a horrendous, difficult time I'd shared with your pastor this week. It was just horrible. And I'd known the church for years new pastor came in and trying to keep th get things back in order and all and I went in and preached and I preached about this being faithful that it's worth it to be faithful while I was sitting on the platform the pastor said to me he said you see those folks sitting over on the right near the aisle over there I said yeah I said that guy looks like he could be a preacher he said he is a preacher he said you know he said I'll tell you the story about him right after the service. He said, remind me. So I preached, gave the invitation, folks dealt with and all, and they had several folks to baptize, and he had a, another man baptize, another pastor that was baptizing that was in the church there, and, and, and Brother Ross came back, and he's standing with me at the back of the auditorium while their baptism's going on. And he said, Brother Booth, he said, that, that preacher is here because several months back, he pastors in West Virginia in the Independent Baptist Church, and he and another Baptist preacher would get together as, as friends and just have fellowship uh, once a week or so, and they'd ride their bikes in those West Virginia mountains for exercise. He said they were going down the mountainside, and his, his, uh, his preacher friend got quite a ways ahead of him. They couldn't see him, and Brother Kreitz, he didn't, he didn't negotiate a curve right, and he went off the side of the mountain. His friend went on, not, not even thinking about it, you know, he just went on for quite a while, and then he thought, man, I better slow down and wait for him. He waited and waited and waited, and Brother Christ didn't show up. So he backtracked. It was two and a half hours later that he found him down the side of the mountain. They had to call Life Flight to come in and fly him to the hospital, and he had all kinds of broken bones, but his worst injury was a brain injury. And after they had him in the hospital for months, they finally said, Pastor, we've done everything we know to do. There's nothing else we know to do. He, his thinking was okay, except he had a problem with short-term memory. He had 
but his, his motor skills were way off. He talked with a slur and his ba- he couldn't keep his balance. For him to walk, his wife had to hold on to him. And, and somebody told him, we read about us a, a new procedure that a neurosurgeon's doing in Dallas and uh, that can help your kind of a brain injury. And so they made some phone calls and he was there that weekend with an appointment to see that neurosurgeon on Monday. And he was there and I preached about it being worth it to be faithful. The pastor shared that story with me and by the time he was done, the baptism was done, prayer was made and people were dismissed and they're going out and shaking hands and they're out the vestibule and some already into their cars and everybody was out except Brother Kreitz and his wife. And so we waited and he's starting down the aisle. His wife's holding on to him and he's walking about like this. And we waited and we waited and we waited. He finally got to the back and I stuck my hand out to shake his hand. But he didn't stick his hand out. He opened up his arms and he threw them around me. He buried his head in my chest. And he just sobbed. Loud, loud, loud sob. People in the best of you could hear him. His dear precious wife standing there. The tears were just streaming. I just held him and patted him. He finally got his composure and he raised his head up and he said, Brother Booth, I'm sorry. I got snot on your coat. <laughs> I said, don't worry, brother. It's sanctified snot. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and then he said to me, thank you for the reminder. It is worth it to be faithful. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to share with you tonight. It is worth it to be faithful. Let's bow our heads for prayer. <laughs> Again, Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you for being such a faith, faithful God to us. We know, Lord, we've all fallen short so many times, but help us tonight, Lord, to just push that reset button to once again commit ourselves to faithfulness to thee. Faithfulness in thy word daily, faithfulness in our prayer lives, faithful in our soul and faithful in our service faithful to be in attendance, just faithful, Lord. Help us tonight. There may be somebody here, Lord, that's not saved. And I pray that you'd convict that heart and draw that heart to come to Christ. Do your work in our hearts now, we pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Nobody looking, I want to ask you tonight, can you say, Brother Booth, thank God I... I can give testimony of when I got saved. I I do remember where I was. I remember how the Spirit of God convicted my heart. I remembered when I saw in Scripture that I could trust Jesus as my Savior and have forgiveness. And I called on Him and trusted Him. And I was born into God's family. And I know right now if I died, I'd go to heaven. I know it's settled. I'm 100% sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I know it's settled. At your honest testimony, would you indicate that by raising your hand? Let's raise it up and put it down and be honest. Thank you. You may put them down. I wonder tonight who would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. But I needed that tonight. Sometimes in the journey, it's been in those difficult times, just like you said, the old devil's come along and said, is it worth it? Brother Booth, I have, maybe you say I, I've let some priorities slide. Or I know that I'm not as faithful as God wants me to be. I know right now areas that, that he's speaking to my heart about that I'm not faithful in. But somewhere during the message tonight as a Christian, the Holy Ghost dealt with my heart and some things I need to get in order with the Lord tonight. Pray for me. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God spoke to your heart tonight. God bless you. Thank God for you. Many hands. Thank the Lord. 
You may put them down. Maybe there's others that need to join them. What would the Lord say if he was here tonight and he picked out the faithful or those who aren't so faithful? Where would you be? Maybe there's some, maybe something I never even mentioned in a sermon, but the Holy Ghost of God is dealing with you about it and you know it. You didn't raise your hand, but you'll raise it now and say, Brother Booth, I didn't raise my hand before, but God is dealing with me about some things I need to settle with you. Pray for me. Include me in the prayer. Slip your hand up. There are others. Glad we waited. God bless you. Somebody else? God bless you. There'd be somebody tonight who'd be honest enough with the Lord to say, you know, I couldn't raise my hand that I'm 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I can't take you to a place where I know I got saved. I have doubts about that. I don't want to die and go to hell. And if I could really know for sure I was forgiven according to the Bible, not because a preacher says so, but because you see it in the Bible, if I could really know it by seeing in the Bible how I could be saved and forgiven, I'd like to be saved. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Just put it up and put it down. That's me. God bless you. Somebody else. That's me. I'm not sure. I've got doubts, but I'd like to have it settled for sure. If I could, according to the Bible, I'd like to have that settled. And you can. You can get it settled tonight, according to the Bible. I want you to stand with me for prayer. After I pray, the music will play. Brother Bob will sing. When Brother Bob sings, God spoke to your heart. Please don't hesitate. Let's find a place at the altar. You raised your hand or you didn't, but God dealing with your heart. Let's not hesitate tonight. You need to be saved. Don't just come and kneel, but you let preacher know when you come that you want to get it settled. You want to be sure you're saved. We'll have somebody trained in the Bible, show you from the Bible how to get that settled tonight. Again, Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. And thank you for being such a great God. What a privilege to serve you, Lord. Help us, Lord. We need your grace. We need your help. We need you to help us, Lord, to lay aside our old pride so that we can receive that sufficient grace. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless now this invitation. You saw many hands raised among Christians. Now help us to be humble enough to come to the altar and confess to you what you're dealing with our hearts about and allow you to give, give victory. And those not sure they're saved, please draw their hearts. Give them the courage to come as others come. To let the preacher know how to, that they want to be saved and how to have it settled for sure so we can show them from your precious word how to be saved tonight. Do your mighty work. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. The music plays. God spoke to your heart. You need to come. You come right now, would you? Let's not hesitate. God speak to your heart. Come on. Oh, soul, are you, you raised your hand. I prayed for you. Troubled. Here's your opportunity. No come light on. in the darkness you see. He resists the proud, but he'll give Savior. grace to the humble. And this is our opportunity to humble ourselves and receive and that free. grace. You need to come, come on. Your eyes upon Jesus. You're not sure you're saved? Please don't Look leave that way. In his wonderful face. Come and let us show you the best news you'll ever see and in the, the Word of God. the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and It's grace. not required in the steward that a man be found Through talented. death into life Just faith. everlasting. He passed Everybody and we can be faithful if they choose to be faithful. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, 
look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father in heaven, we thank you now for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the message from your word. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And I pray that you would help each of us to be faithful to you. That surely, Lord, thank you for the wonderful promises you give to us if we'll just be faithful. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us would be found faithful in your sight. Thank you for each one that's been here this evening. Thank you for Brother Booth and for his faithfulness to proclaim your word to us. Continue to have your hand upon him. Use him in the remainder of the week, Lord, as he ministers in the prison and here on Friday night to our youth group. And Lord, give him safety as he goes back home to his family on Saturday. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Lord, dismiss us now with your care, Lord, and I pray that each of us would be mindful of your presence as we leave this place tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Hey, take your songbook. Turn over to number two, would you? Number two. Off time, the day seems long, our trials hard to bear, but it will be worth it all when we see Christ. Amen. Let's sing that together, all right? Off times, the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. Oh, tears forever over in God's eternal day. Sing it now. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's drops will seem so small. When we see Christ, one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. God bless you. You are dismissed. Choir, you'll have practice tonight. <laughs>